begin today a new Perek, Kuf Yutes Amad Aleph, the last Perek of Masechta Yuvamis, which is referred to as Aisha Basra. We had three Prokham that began with the same word Aisha. One is called Aisha Rabba, because it's a longer Perek. Then the fr- previous Perek was called Aisha Shalim. And this one is called Aisha Basra. So, the Heilig Mishnah. Continuing the Halachas regarding a woman that comes and says that her husband passed away, regarding what do we believe her, regarding what not, when could she get remarried. A woman, her husband, and her, the co-wife, they went together overseas. And they came and told her, Your husband passed away. So now the question is, did her husband have any children when he passed away? When he left overseas, as Rashi says, he had no children. So at that point, there was a chazake that this should have to be a mitzvah of yibum. But the question though is, he went overseas together with a wife. So maybe when he passed away, his wife had a, had a baby. So then she can't do Yibum. She, she, if, if the husband passed away, she can go get married to whoever she wants. So the Mishnah says, tinose, She can't get married to anybody. Because perhaps she does have to do the mitzvah of Yibum. But at the same time, yabim, She can't do the mitzvah of Yibum because maybe the, the, there was a baby born. Until she'll find out, until she'll know whether the other wife, whether she's pregnant or not. Oh, oh so the Gemara is going to ask that. The is going to ask, why can't you just do chalitza and then she'll be allowed for everybody? We'll see in the Gemara. So, another case. What happens if her husband went overseas and at the time when her husband left, there were no other brothers that her husband had bachlal? So what does that mean? That even if her husband passed away without any children, there is no mitzvah of yibum because no, there's no brother alive to do yibum. So she would be allowed to get married to anybody. So when her husband left, her chazak is she can go get married to whoever she wants. But now, she also had a mother-in-law that, uh, that, uh, that was overseas. Now the question is, what happened? Maybe her mother-in-law gave birth. So now there is a brother here. So she has to do yibum. Eino chayshashas. She does not have to be concerned about the fact that maybe her mother-in-law had a baby and there's a son there, that she, there's a yavam that she has to do yivam for. Why not? So Rashi explains there's a difference between this case and the previous case. When it comes to the previous case, it doesn't matter if the baby that's born is a zohar or an akeva. Either way, that practice her from yivam. So over there she has to be chayshish for the birth. Maybe the co-wife gave birth to either a zohar or an akeva. When it comes, however, here, if there's an Akeva that was born, there's no mitzvah of Yibam. It's only maybe there was a Zacha that was born. <coughs> so therefore, Rashi says, we're not chayshish for this. Because first of all, it's possible that she never gave birth Bechlal. And even if she did give birth, so there's still a Suffolk, maybe it's a Zacha or it's an Akeva. So it comes out that in Raif scenarios, the, the, there would not be any mitzvah of Yibam here. So therefore, you're not chayshish for this. Ya, it's a similar if her mother-in-law, when she left town, she, went, she left town already Malaya, meaning pregnant. So over here we now know that she's giving birth. Elamai, the only question is whether it's a Zohar or a Nekeva, She does have to be concerned, not, uh, th- yeah, she does have to be concerned that maybe she has the mitzvah of Yibu. Rabbi Shua, Rabbi Shua says, Eine Even when her mother-in-law left pregnant, she still doesn't have to be concerned. Why? Because there's a third possibility. And that is that maybe the mother-in-law miscarried. So it, it could be it was a zacha, could be a nekeva, could be a miscarriage. So even if you know that she's pregnant, still the zacha is, is a minority uh, option of what happened there. So therefore you still don't have to be chayshish for this either. So the Gemara. So the Gemara focuses on first on a diuk over here in the case of the Mishnah. My, what is the meaning of the terminology of the Mishnah when it says he tzadasa? The words of the Mishnah was that she has to be, she has to find out achateda shemum uberes he tzadasa. Why does it add those two words? Maybe the tzada is pregnant. What's the emphasis? It could have just said shemum uberes. We know we're talking about the tzada that went with the husband overseas. And says the Gemara, hakamashmulan. This is what the Mishnah is teaching us. Lahat tzada hu we're only going to be concerned about this tzara that we know that went overseas with the husband if she's pregnant or not. But, but if Adam came and said that this tzara that he went overseas with is not pregnant, so we don't have to be chayshish that maybe the husband went overseas and he got married to a third wife there. Maybe that happened. For that we don't have to be chayshish. So in the Reish of the Mishnah, 
So she can't get remarried, but she also can't do the mitzvah of Yibum because we're going to be cheshish that maybe the tzada was pregnant, maybe the tzada had a baby. We understand why the, you can't do the mitzvah of Yibum because the Dilma Mabra, possibly this tzada is pregnant. So now, the Kapaga Be'eshe if there's no mitzvah of Yibum because this wife is having a baby, so then not only is there no mitzvah, but there's an iser of Eshesach, your wife's brother. Your brother's wife, that is. So and that's the iser midday raisa. So now we understand why there's no, you can't do Yibum over here. But but when the Mishnah says that on the other hand, she should not go and get married to anybody, am I? Why not? There's a roiv here. Why shouldn't we follow? What happens to the majority of women, and what's that majority? What's the raiv? The raiv noshim is abres v'yeldes. Most women do become pregnant, and they give birth from this pregnancy. And therefore, over here, if her husband went overseas with her wife, we could assume that probably she gave birth, and therefore she should be mutter to get married to anybody based on this raiv. So, like Mara continues, Leime, shall we say that Rab Meiri, that the Mishnah here that says that she can't go and get married to anybody, is following Rab Meir's opinion. What's the chilish of Rab Meir? The chayesh l'miyuta. Rab Meir says, you do have to be concerned for the minority of what could have happened. That there are, there are minority of women that will not become pregnant and will not give birth. And therefore over here, even this, so this husband of hers that went overseas with a co-wife, so we have to be chayshish for the miyut that she did not give birth. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, so the Chayda, our Mishnah is Rab Meir. Says the Gemara, no, not necessarily. We could even say that this Mishnah follows Rabbanon's opinion that say that you're only Chayshish for a Reiv, but you're not Chayshish for a Miyot. But the difference is as follows. There's two different types of Reivs. When you follow majority, there's two different ways that you can be following majority. And this is a very <laughs> fundamental concept here. Kiyos li Rabbanon basaruba. When did the Rabbanon say that you follow the Reiv? Ruba de Isa Kamon. When you have a majority that's right here in front of us, and they want to give two examples for this. Kogain Teisha Chanuyes, the famous case about nine stores. When you have, let's say, nine stores that are selling kosher meat, one store that's selling non kosher meat, and you find a piece of meat in the street, and you're not sure which store it came from, so you follow the Raif. You have nine stores that are right here in front of us. And another example is Sanhedrin. When you have a Sanhedrin that's arguing about a Psak Din, and you have a, usually a bezin of 23, and you have 11 that say that he's, that he's chayiv, and you have 12 that say that he's, that he's potter, or zakai. So you follow the raiv. So that's again a raiv that's present right in front of us. So over there you follow the raiv. Alaru with the lesser come on. But when there's a raiv that's based on the majority of the nature of people, it's not a majority that's actually in front of us. So layazi rabbanam basaruba. Majority of women in the world so are usually misabris v'yeldas, become pregnant and give birth. So that's, that's a raiv b'negei to the nature of the women in the world. It's not a raiv that we're dealing with right over here regarding a suffix of a raiv that we have in front of us. That's a different kind of raiv. So the Gemara is basically saying this type of raiv is not as strong as a raiv. This is basically a raiv that you're, you're concluding something based on the, on the r- nature of things. When you have a raiv that's right in front of you, it's a much stronger raiv. You're saying that the, it's, it's plausible to say that this meat actually came from rave of the stores that are right here in front of us. That's a much stronger rave. That's the rave that Chacham will follow. But a rave that's not in front of us, so even the Rabbana would agree that you, you do have to be cheshesh for the meat. Fractigamare, could that be true? Vahare cotton or katana. But there's a case regarding a cotton and a katana, which the Gemara will not bring here a braise. We have learned this before also. The rube de lesa kamoni. And this is the case of a raiv that's not in front of something in front of us. Vazli Rabbanu Basaruba. And the Rabbanu f- still followed the raiv. What is this? The Tanya we learned earlier, Katan Akhtana. Regarding a Katan and a Katana, there's no Khalitsa and there's no Yibo. Divrei Rab Meir. This is Rab Meir's opinion. Omrulay Rab Meir. So the Chachamim say to Rab Meir, Yafa Amarta Shein Khalitsa. This that you say that there's no Khalitsa for a Yavim or for a Katan or a Katana, that you're right. Because Ish. It says that it has to be a ish, so we know that it can't be a cotton. And also, we compare the ish to the ish that it can't be a katana either. Hello, the question on them is, is why not uh, do any yibum for a cotton and a katana? We learned a few times before in the Masechta, for the mitzvah of yibum, you don't even need any das at all. So why not do yibum? So the Gemara answers, cotton. 
Shema Yim Tzasris, Rab Meir says regarding a cotton, we're concerned that maybe this cotton will be a sris, can't give any birth, so there's no mitzvah of Yibam in such a case. And the same with a katana, katana Shema Tim Tzailanis, maybe she's an islandist, and in such a case there's no mitzvah of Yibam. And if so, the Nimtzu Paikim Be'erve, so if they're getting married to one another, it's Eish Yisach, it's a erve. that's why we have to wait to determine if, there's, if he's a sris or not, or an islandist or not, when he becomes a god and she becomes a gadayla. Now, why did the Rabbanan disagree with this? The Rabbanan Savri, the Rabbanan says, Zil Basaruba, you follow the status of the Raiv of, of people in the world. The Ketanim and the Raiv Ketanim laugh Srisi Nino. Most Ketanim are not Srisi, are, are people that have the ability to give birth. And Zil Basaruba Ketanis, and you follow also the majority regarding Ketanis. The Raiv Ketanis love Islands Nino. So what do you see right over here? The Rabbanan are following a raiv, which is less a kaman, which is not a raiv based on our facts and things that you have right in front of us. They're following a raiv regarding the nature of people in the world. And still the Rabbanan follow the raiv. So you can't say that our Mishnah that follows the miyot is going according to the Rabbanan because the Rabbanan agree by a raiv, the less a kaman, that's not in front of us. And if the Gemara goes back to what it said before, El machvarte masnis and rabmeiri. So the best pshat is like we said before, that this Mishnah here that's concerned about a miyot is following Rav Meir's opinion. So now going along with this. This Mishnah is Rav Meir. So our Mishnah is going according to Rav Meir that's concerned about a miyot. If so, what does it say in the safe of the Mishnah? There was a mother-in-law that went out of town. So when she went out, when the husband, the husband also went out of town, the mother-in-law also, and when the husband left out of town, there was no other brother here. And now we're concerned, maybe the mother-in-law gave birth. So what did the Mishnah say? So you don't have to be concerned, Bechlal, and this woman could, could go and get remarried. There's no, there's no Yibu, we're not Chayshish, maybe there's a son that was born. Question is, why not? So why shouldn't we say as follows? First of all, there's Reiv Noshim. The Reiv Noshim is Abrais Vyeldais. There is a Reiv that become pregnant and give birth. Miot Mapilais. There is a Miot that miscarry. That's one point. So, so far we have a Reiv. Reiv women would give birth. But then we have a Chala Yeldis. Then regarding all births in the world. So the assumption is, Mechtz is Chodim and Mechtz is So it's half and half, half Chodim and half Nekevis. And over here what's relevant for us is that the child that's born is a Zachar. So therefore that would enable Yibo. So now we have the Mechtz is Chodim and Mechtz is And Smoich mi Uta de Mapilois, Le Mechtz in Nekevis. So according to Rav Meir that says that you have to take into account a, a Miut, the minority of what happens. So now you can take that Miut of women that miscarry and combine that to the fact that is Mechtz and Nekevois, and that half give birth to Nekevois. Vahavele is a Chorim Yuta. So now there's a Chorim that are born. The, the option of saying that what the baby that this mother in law gave birth to would be a Zachar, that's only a Miut, right? Because there's another two options of what could have happened. Either the, the mother in law miscarried, or she had a, a Nekeva. But you still have a Miut of Zacharim that could have been born. And if so, the Leichish, so we should be concerned. That maybe the, the mother in law had a child of Zachar. Aye, the child of the, the Zachar is only a miut. But this is Rameir though. Rameir is Chayshish for a miut. Answers the Gemara. Over here it's different. Why? Dilma. Over here, maybe we could say, Kivin the Ichzakal Ashok, once there was a Chazaka in advance. When the mother left out of town, when her husband left out of town, there was a Chazaka that there's no brother, and therefore she had a Chazaka, she can get married to whoever she wants. Once you have that previous chazake, loy chayish. Even Rab Meir would agree that you're not chayish for a miut. When does Rab Meir say that you have to be concerned about a minority when there's no prior chazake? But over here there was a chazake that she was mutter to go married to get married to whoever she wants. So therefore you're not chayish for a miut. If so, say the exact same thing in the Reisha. We said the Reisha goes according to Rab Meir, and he is Chayshish for Miyat there. Reisha, the Echzakli Yibum, the Reisha over there, the Chazaka was that she does have to do Yibum when the husband left overseas. There was no child that was born, there was a brother. There was no child that was born. The husband <laughs> left together with a wife, and you're concerned maybe the wife gave birth, and this is going to change your previous chazaka. And over there, you said that Rab Meir is chayshish for a miyot, and she can't be miyavim. But if you're saying that we have to follow the chazaka in the beginning, so so tiyavim, you should be able to do yivim. 
Amar Rav Nachman, Amar Rabbe Baravua, there's a difference. Reisha, the Issachadis, when it comes to the Reisha, because over there, allowing her to do Yibo might be a Issachadis. Eisha Sach, it's a Erva, Issachadis, Choshesh. So over there, Rav Meir is Choshesh for a Miyot. Seifa, this is a lav, and the Seifa, what are we dealing with? The Issa of her being allowed to get married to anybody in the street. And if she has to do Yibum, so then that's only a lav. But it's not a Issa Kodis. So, so regarding Issa lav, Rav Meir is not Choshesh for a Miyot. But Rav disagrees with this. Let's see. How can you make this distinction between a Kodis or a lav? Both of these Yisurim are Yisurim and Atayda. Mali is a kodesh, mali is a lav. Why should there be any difference between a kodesh and a lav? So Rashi says, if you would have something which is only asim the rabbanon, so then you could say we're not going to be chayshish for a miut regarding asim the rabbanon. But if it's something which is asim and atayda, there's no reason to be mechalik between a lav or a kodesh. If you chayshish for a miut, you have to be chayshish. You have to be concerned about the minority in either case. So this can't be the explanation. Ela Marave. So therefore, Rav explains. There's another cheshbon here. There's another explanation for the difference between the reisha and the seifa. Reisha. So the cheshbon goes as follows: In the reisha, chazak liyibum. So let's start the case from the beginning when the husband leaves overseas and he has no children when he leaves. So the first thing is there's a status. There's a chazak that she would have to do yibum. And then veruba l'shuk. But then though there's a raiv that tells us that she should be allowed to get married to anybody and not do yibum. Why? Because most women that leave overseas with their wife. So we could assume, based on the raiv, that he probably became pregnant and probably gave birth. And therefore there's a raiv that actually goes against the chazaka. The raiv says that she should be allowed to get married to anybody. And therefore we have the following rule. Chazaka lo adif kiruba. Relying on a chazaka is not as strong as relying on raiv. This is a concept the Gemara talks about in other places. When you have a chazaka that tells you something in one direction, over here the chazaka tells you that she should do yibum, and the raiv tells you she should not do yibum. What's stronger? Raiv is stronger than Chazaka. And now, so now we're following Rab Meir's opinion. So according to Rab Meir, a minority option of what could have happened is, is relevant. So now you have also a miut. There's a miut of Mapilois. There's a miut of those that miscarry. So now you take that miut and you combine it to the Chazaka that says the status that there was in the beginning that there was no children that were born. And now, Havale Palga Palga. So if so, it comes out, even though usually Chazaka is weaker than right, but over here, since you're combining the miut to the Chazaka, so now that Chazaka will be considered to be equivalent to the raiv, and now it's going to be like half and half. We have a, a doubt which is half and half. And therefore, that's why in the ratio of the mission it said, either way she can't go get married, and she can't do yibum, because it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a suffix that's half and half. That's the ratio of the Mishnah. Just uh, quickly, and just a Chaga, to this concept, it's a very fundamental thing, B'nigayat to Reiv and Chazake, that Chazake is not as strong as Reiv, what's the reason? So there's a famous Hezba that all the Achreinim say, there's a, a, a basic difference between Chazake and Reiv. Chazake is not really something that's based on something logical. Chazake is just a previous status. And, and you're, you're leaving it, and we're behaving according to the previous status that we knew until now. Reiv is something much stronger. Reiv is something that's more logical. When you have... When you have to look at percentage-wise of, of how something happened, it makes sense that the way the raiv is, that's what played out. So a raiv is, is actually something much stronger, much more logical to rely upon than the chazake. That's why raiv is stronger than chazake. Okay, so this is all that has before the reisha. Now in the seife, what happens here? So seife, chazake l'shok. Over here in the seife, when her husband left overseas and her mother-in-law left overseas, the chazake is that she could get married to whoever she wants. Why? Because there was no other brother. So that's the first thing. Chazake is that she can get married to whoever she wants. And veruba l'shok. And there's also a raiv that she can get married to whoever she wants. Why? Because what, what are we concerned about? That maybe her mother-in-law gave birth. But when a mother-in-law gives birth, there are three things that could happen. Either, either she can give birth to an Akeva, or she can give birth to a Zohar, or she can miscarry. So out of those three options, the Zohar is the minority of what could have happened. Rave of the options of what could have happened to this mother-in-law that, that became pregnant is that either it's a miscarriage or it's an Akeva. So just like the Chazake says that she can get married to whoever she wants, the Rave also says that she can get married to whoever she wants. 
Vahavilei, but now again we're going according to Rab Meir, and Rab Meir says you have to be concerned about a miut. Vahavilei zecharim miute de miute, but over here there's a difference. This that the mother-in-law may have given birth to a zachar, this is not just a miut, but this is a miute de miute. You have first of all the previous chazaka that we had in the beginning that there were no brothers here b'chlal, okay. and then you have over here this uh, rave. <coughs> that says that there's another two options. Could be the mother-in-law miscarried, and also could be that the mother-in-law gave birth to an akeva. So therefore this is a miyuta dimiyuta, or miyuta dimiyuta loichayish Rav Meir. For such a, a type of minority, Rav Meir is not, even Rav Meir agrees that you're not chayishish for. That's why the Mishnah said that she can go get married to whoever she wants. Okay, now. Now the Gemara focuses on the beginning of the Mishnah, going again back to the case in the Reisha, where it said, so again, the case was when you had a woman that her husband went out of town together with the tzara, with a co-wife, and they didn't have any children when they left. But now it's possible that she had a wife, she had a son that is overseas. So as the Gemara explained before, this is a suffix, and therefore she can't get married to anybody else, but at the same time she can't do yibum either. Does this mean forever she should be stuck this way? So as Rashi says, the Gemara's question in essence is, why can't they just do chalitza? And once you have chalitza done, so now Maman Avshach, she would be mutter. Answers the Gemara, Oma Zi'iri, so Zi'iri answers, you write, as we'll see the Gemara here, Zi'iri will say that really chalitza would help. And what the Mishnah means is as follows, Le'atzma, as far as this woman herself is concerned, Shloisha Chadoshim, she will have to wait three months until she could do Yibum. Now this halacha of waiting three months is really not something that's a chiddush over here in our sugya. This is something we learned already earlier in the Masechta, the Bachlal. You always have to wait three months before you can do Yibum in order to determine, to know if there is a mitzvah of Yibum over here. Possibly she's a, a Muberes and maybe she's pregnant and therefore there is no mitzvah of Yibum Bachlal. So you always have to wait three months. That's as far as herself is concerned. But now the Chiddush over here in our case, which is L'chaverta, the fact that her husband went overseas with the co-wife and could be she had a baby. So for that, Tisha, nine months you have to wait to get remarried. But the Chalitza could be done and either way she would be Mutter. So what, the, what Rav Ziri is saying is, according to the way Rashi explains it here, that you write, you could talk to Chalitza even before the nine months. But she won't be allowed to get remarried until after the nine months. And the reason is because if she does chalitza before the nine months are up. So in the event that this co-wife is not pregnant, so then that chalitza took effect and that would theoretically be mat to her right away. But if the co-wife is pregnant, then that chalitza did not do anything. That chalitza is worthless because in a case where there's a pregnancy, there is no chalitza. And you're going to have to wait until after nine months that the child is born in order for her, for this wife, to be ready to get married to anybody, to be mutter, to get married to anybody. And the reason is because the child that's born is only matter, the wife, to get married to anybody else, only after he's born. The pregnancy alone is not a heter. The pregnancy stops the effect of the chalitza, but at the same time, the hetta for to get married to the whole world is only after the child is born. So therefore, within that period of nine months, she will not be allowed to get married. But after nine months, once chalitza was done already, so Maman of Shach, she can go get married to whoever she wants. Rab Chanina argues and says, La'atzma, so as we said before, like it is by every woman. So for herself, Shloisha, she has to wait three months until she gets remarried. L'chaverta lo'ilam. And this, that she's concerned about the other wife that may have had a child, so for this, she's going to have to wait forever, meaning that chalitza will not work. So forever here doesn't literally mean forever, but as Rashi says, that we're going to have to wait until we actually find out the fact. What happened to the other wife? Did she have a child or did she not? But the point is, chalitza does not work. Why not? As we asked basically in the beginning this question, why can't she just do chalitza? And then after nine months, we say that now she can get remarried to whoever she wants. As answers the Gemara, Abaya bar Ovin, Verbchanina bar Ovin, Omri Tarvayu. They both explain the reason why we don't accept chalitza here. There's a gzayde mit Rabbonon. Gzayde shem yehei vlad ben kayama. What happens if it turns out that this pregnancy was actually a viable pregnancy and the child was born 
And now what happened? They did chalitza before because maybe there would be no viable child. And we'd, oh, we don't know. We're not going to bother to wait to find out whether there was or wasn't. And therefore they did chalitza. But now, once you find out that there was a viable child born, the nimta atamatsricha kruz lekohone. And now everybody's going to look at this woman as a chalutza. They did chalitza. If she's a chalutza, she's also to get married to Kain. And now it turns out the chalitza was worthless. We're going to have to make a special announcement for her to let everybody, everybody know that really this chalitza did not take effect at all. In order for people to understand that she really is mutta to go and get married to a kain. Says the Gemara, Nusa, what's so terrible? The litzracha. So you'll make that announcement. You'll let everybody know that the chalitza was not a chalitza and therefore she can get married to a kain. Says the Gemara, Dilme ikke dahave ba chalitza vilehave ba chroza. But that it's possible that maybe people will be present by the chalitza and they won't be present when this announcement was made that that chalitza was worthless. And then Va'amri, those people will say, look, kasharu chalitza lekayin. They are allowing this chalitza to get married to a kayin. That's the issue. So therefore, you're going to have to wait until you can determine for sure to know if she was pregnant or not so people will know if this chalitza is a chalitza or not. So the Gemara asks on this. Tanan, we learned in the Mishnah, this was in the previous Patek, so there it says, Nitin li ben, what happens a woman that went overseas with her husband, and she comes back to say that her husband passed away. When she left overseas, she had no children. So at that point, her status was that she doesn't need any Yibam. Uh, again, that she does need Yibam. And then, but she comes and says, Nitin li ben bimdin sayam, I had a child overseas. So she's saying that her status changed. But now she said, Va'amra meiz bini, that son that I had passed away, va'achakach baili, and then my husband passed away. Now menes, that she's believed to say. Why? Because she's not changing her previous status. The status she had when she left, that she had to do yibum, remains the same. But if she comes and says, meiz baili va'achakach bini, she comes and says, my husband passed away, and then my son passed away. Ain't a matter. So now we don't believe her because she's saying something. She's changing her previous chazak. She left with a chazak that she has to do yibum. And now she's saying, I had a son. And even though my son passed away, but he passed away after my husband and I, have to, and I don't have to do yibum. So she, she can't change her status. But nevertheless, we can't completely ignore what she's saying. She is going to have to do chalitze and not yibum. But how could you say over here that you have to do chalitze and not yibum? The Leicher, shouldn't we be concerned for the point that we said before? Dilma also, Edom va'amri kiddekamra. Maybe it'll turn out that what she said is true. Edom are going to come and back up her words and say that she had a son and her son passed away after the father. And if so, she did not really need any chalitza. And then you're going to have to make an announcement that it should be known that the chalitza done for this woman was worthless and therefore she's really allowed to get married to Akain. So the fact that we, allow, we tell her to do chalitza means that we're not concerned that we're going to have to make this announcement to tell people that the chalitza was, was worthless. And says the Gemara, Omer Av Pape Begrusha. Over there what it's speaking about is a woman that's anyways not allowed to get married to Akain. She was already previously a Grusha. She got divorced from a previous marriage. So there's no issue. She's not getting married to Akain. Rav Chie Bared Rav Huna Omar, or it could be another scenario. But Omra when she comes and says that I was with my husband and he passed away and then afterwards the son passed away she said that we were together in a place secluded from society we were in a cave together and there was nobody else there so therefore we're not concerned that Adam are going to come along to back up the words that she said so therefore we're not concerned that later it's going to, it's going to be clear that the whole chalitza was worthless we're never, we're never going to be able to determine whether this chalitza was worthless or not Zakta Mishne Shte Yevamis. No, 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 that's that. Okay. No, uh, we had it before in the Gemara. The Gemara yeah. before brought Psukim that uh, if there's a child that dies afterwards. The Gemara brought before Psukim for this. The Gemara asked your question. The Gemara brought Psukim for this, that, that uh, there's a difference. <laughs> So you have two Yavamais, so they're married to, but each to their husband, and each one comes and says that my husband passed away. So now, <coughs> so what we're talking about over here is two women that are married to brothers, right? So therefore, 
each one, if their husband passed away, they would have to do yibum with the other one, with the other one's wife. Now, but the halacha is that they're going to be oser. So, so what is the Mishnah saying here? This goes back to halacha that it said in the previous Patek, a yavama, that is a wife of your yavam, is not believed to say, A, this for you, that the, that he, that the husband passed away. Okay, so therefore, over here, each one is saying a this about their own husband that passed away. For that, each one of them is believed to say that their husband passed away. But the, the wife of the brother that says that the husband passed away, she's not believed to say a this for you, that that wife, husband passed away, and therefore you don't have a Yavam alive to do Yibam with. She's not believed to say that for you. So therefore, you're Taka believed to say for yourself, that, as far as for yourself is concerned, we accept your Adis that your husband passed away. But for the brother that you have to do Yibum for, we don't accept the Adis of his wife that you should not have to do Yibum. So therefore, each one of them is going to be usher to go and get married to whoever they want. We assume that he still could be alive. That's the first case. Now, what happens if Lezu Adim or Lezu Ein Adim, if they both come to say that their husband passed away, and now one of these women also has Adim that's backing up a word, saying that her husband passed away. And the other wife does not have Adim that backs up her words to say that her husband passed away. So now it's going to come out as follows. The one that has Adim that her husband passed away, Asura. She will actually be forbidden to go get married to anyone else. Why? Because the brother that she has to do Yibum for, there's no Adam saying that he passed away. The only one you're relying on is his, his wife. And his wife is not believed to say for, for, the, for her that he passed away. So it shall be us, sir. The Esha Adam, the one that comes and says that her husband passed away, she has no Adam, Muteres. She's going to be allowed to get married to anybody because she's believed to say regarding her husband that he passed away. And regarding the Yavam, she's not relying on the other wife, on his wife. She's relying on Adam. She's relying on his Adam that he has that he passed away. What happens if, again, we have over here these two wives married to, uh, to two brothers, Lazu Bonim, Lazu Ain Bonim. One of them has children, and the one, other one does not have children. And they both come and say that their husband passed away. So, as she has Bonim, the one that has children, Mutaras, she can get married to whoever she wants. Because all she needs is to be believed that her husband passed away. There's no Yibum, then she can get married to whoever she wants. That Sha'ila Bonim, Asura. But the one that has no children, so even if we believe that her husband passed away, but she still would have to do Yibum. And we don't believe the other wife to say that the husband passed away, that she should be potter from Yivam. So she'll be Yasser. This Yavmo, what happened if these, well, again, we're talking about going back to the ratio of the Mishnah. We're talking about a case where two wives, each one is saying that their husband passed away. And so what did we say in the ratio of the Mishnah? That each one would be us to get married to anyone else because we don't believe the edus of each wife regarding the other one that there is no Yavam here for Yibo. So that, that we don't believe. But now what happens if Nisiyavmo? There is another brother that's here, that's alive. And each one of them went and did Yibo with another brother that's here. And now, Meso Ayyavamin, and now this Yavam that they got married to also passed away without any children. So now they, they would have to do Yibo. But who would they have to do Yibo with? They would have to do Yibo with that, that other brother that left overseas and we were told that, he's, that he passed away, but we're not 100% sure that he passed away. Says the Mishnah, they're not going to be allowed to get married. Again, this goes back to the same point. Why are they not going to be allowed to get married? Because that brother that went overseas, you're relying on the edus of, the other wi of his wife that you can get remarried. We don't accept the edus of another wife to free, for, for, for her, that she should be allowed to get remarried. But regarding this case, Rabbi Laza says, over here it's different. Because there's a heta for her. We already were mad to her to get married to this Yavam, this brother that was here. So now once they were mad to her to do Yibum, they are allowed to do Yibum for anybody in the world. The Gemara will explain Rabbi Laza's opinion. Can I just see one small piece of the Gemara here? So Tane, we learned in the Mishnah, or actually that we learned in Abraisa that is, in a case of Luzu Edim Ubanim, so one of the wives that came and said that her husband passed away, she also has Edim backing up her words, and she also has children. And Luzu and the other wife, Loy Edim Veloy Banim, the other one does not have no Edim backing up her words, but she doesn't have any children either. Shteyen Mutares. 
they're, they're going to both be mutter. The one that has Edim and she has children, obviously she's going to be mutter to get married to whoever she wants. And the other one that does not have any Edim and not, and not any children either is also going to be mutter. Because she's believed to say that her own husband passed away. And she's also relying on the Edim of the, of the other husband, of the other wife, that he passed away. So she can get married to whoever she wants. This Yavmo, okay, this goes back actually to the Mishnah, and this continues uh, the continuation of the Gemara. We'll stop over here. But you can't rely.